Welcome to All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light driving scientific innovation in the 21st century. I'm Joel Williams, Associate Editor at Photonics Media. Join us as we explore the latest trends in optics, lasers, microscopy, and spectroscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape, brought to you by Photonics Media. As the technologies that dot the integrated photonics value chain continue to improve, the broader ecosystem that they support has entered a new and critical era. The innovation characterizing these technological gains is no longer the most accurate gauge for charting progress in this sector. Rather, it is the prospect that these technologies find their place in resolving long-standing bottlenecks that now determines success in this field. The applications are more set in stone than ever before. Implementation awaits. The ability to resolve the barriers associated with commercialization is key to the ability of PICs to find their way. Multi-tiered collaboration sits at the heart of the industry's pursuit of this quest with entities around the world increasing their bandwidth to bridge innovation and productization. In today's conversation, we do our best to present this evolving dynamic from the perspectives of two individuals who know it best. Peter O'Brien, who heads the Photonics Packaging Group at Tyndall National Institute, and David McGovern, Senior Business Development Manager at the Irish Photonic Integration Center, or IPIC. Their insights into photonic integration are particularly relevant for many reasons, not the least of which, in this age of the EU and US CHIPS Acts, is their knowledge of photonics endeavors on both sides of the Atlantic. While the journey from lab to fab informs our discussion, we focus more on the journey from fab to, say, data center. We begin with an exploration of the dynamic, as it currently exists, between PICs, R&D, and real-world implementation. In doing so, we hear from O'Brien about a second dynamic, that which exists between photonics and integration. Uh, Aside from Peter, your your luminary status in the industry, uh, our theme this season sort of uh, is is guided by this interplay between uh, high-level R&D and photonics and, and productization or commercialization. Um, and in the integrated photonic space, this is really a nuanced dynamic. And from the platform, Peter, that your position provides, can you sort of paint a picture of what the dynamic looks like in PICS specifically right now? Um, so, so we just elaborate on that question a little bit more. So, yeah, it, it's this, you know, PICS is, is a new technology, but it's it's clearly a very powerful one. How do we take yeah. that from that understanding and put that into product and commercialization? I'm just hoping for you to paint a picture of that dynamic right now. Yeah, yeah, it's actually quite an interesting dynamic because for a number of reasons, we'll probably kind of elaborate more on um, in this conversation. But one of the big drivers at the moment that really is being motivated a lot by things like the CHIPS Act, both here in Europe and also in the US, is this strong linkage with microelectronics and semiconductors in general. So integrated photonics, I suppose there's two aspects to this. One is photonics. And the other aspect is integration. And integration of semiconductors has been with us for many, many years. And it's a multi-billion, trillion dollar type industry. So you have this enormous expertise, enormous you know, investments and, and great productization of uh, semiconductor and microelectronics principally. So you know, we're starting to see much more convergence of the photonics aspect, that first part I mentioned, with microelectronics and integration in general. So there's really a huge opportunity there. And that hasn't really been the case up until recently. And I think initiatives like the CHIPS Act has really kind of brought this to our attention. Um, And you're beginning to see some of the major foundries, because one of the challenges historically over the last, say, 10 years has been, how do we kind of move from low level R&D, low TRL technology readiness levels, um, to uh, mass manufacture, because the, the real opportunity here for integrated photonics is scaling up, addressing mass markets and communications, healthcare, you know, all those kind of uh, scalable markets. And, and as I say, the challenge has been that scaling. Well, microelectronics does that really, really well. And there's a lot of commonality in the fabrication, in the equipment, 
and just the general kind of process flows and disciplines that are that are already well established. So I would say the most exciting kind of uh, developments more recently have been around this overlap or merger or um, kind of synergies between microelectronics and photonics. And we're starting to see some of those terms being more widely used, more widely accepted by photonics people, things like chiplets, um, you know, integration with electronics in all its different forms. Um, so I would say, you know, without focusing on too many things, I think that's probably been the biggest dynamic. Um, and of course, we have a lot of workforce in the microelectronics area. So um, we can, and that's always been a challenge. We, we, we recognize that here at Tyndall, for example, getting experienced people um, has always been a challenge, workforce development. Well, we have a really experienced workforce out there in microelectronics. So there's so many reasons why there's massive benefits to um, this type of synergy, this type of collaboration. And I think that's that's been really accelerated over the, over the re recent few years. Uh, and David, I promise I'll bring you in here in a second, but I want to build on something, uh, Peter, that you brought up. Uh, and it's this uh, conflation, I guess, between um, mm -hmm. microelectronics, chips, uh, and, and semiconductor, just conflation on the verbiage side. You know, where does integrated photonics stop? Where do microelectronics begin? And certainly on like the metrology side, for instance, there's some uniquely photonic activity going mm -hmm. on, uh, and that stems a lot from the CHIPS Act. I is there a, a benefit to, to merging or conflating microelectronics and photonics, or is there still a need to sort of keep those two disciplines separate as far as advancing the technology goes? Well, there's obviously diff different uh, aspects. You know, you have physical differences um, between the optical and the electrical domain. But I'll give you one very nice example, and it, this is really an important area, is like AI. So one of the big challenges with AI is the, the amount of data that we have to bring to the processor core. Um, and the challenge with electronics alone is that it has capacity limits. So I heard a great term the edge of the chip is not sufficient for the core or for the middle. So essentially what that means is the amount, the ability to bring data from the edge of the, of the electronic chip is limited. Photonics can address that limitation because it can handle much more data in terms of you know, communication between the outside and the internal chip world. So in that kind of scenario, what you have is integration of photonic chips it could be a fully integrated monolithic solution, but more often than not, you would have an interposer, a chiplet type scenario where you have a photonic chip, flip chipped with an electronic processor chip. And you'll have a platform like an interposer um, where you communicate electrically at a very short distance and um, between the photonic chip, which bringing in the data, um, and that could be fiber attached to the photonic chip. Um, and there are other uh, techniques that we're looking at to parallelize that. But essentially, the photonic chip is the communications input and output, the optical and IOs, and the electrical chip then does the processing. So I think that's a really nice example of how photonics and microelectronics are merging um, from a technical perspective, you know, from an applications perspective. But um, more so than that, the ecosystem in terms of equipment, in terms of processing, in terms of people, um, all those kind of materials and so forth that are needed to, to produce these, um, we can utilize what's already well, well established in the microelectronics world, rather than trying to kind of reinvent it or redevelop it in terms of integrated photonics. So I think that's a really nice example showing how from the applications point of view, there's a benefit to these two technologies working together. Um, and then in terms of the actual manufacturing, um, there's a clear benefit as well. And I'll bring in David and I'll, I'll, I'll pose the same question to you that kicked off our, our joint interview here. Uh, you know, David, you have some business development uh, insights to bring to this. So I'll ask you the same question about the dynamic of, of commercialization and productization, integrated photonics, just to, to paint a picture for us. What you've seen from, uh, thanks for that, Jake. What we've seen from Peter saying there is that there's, there's sort of two real layers to it. One is the existing industries that, that are there that already have an infrastructure, supply chains, footprints in different countries all, all, all around the world. And the CHIPS Act in Europe is driving that towards uh, investment here. And what you see or, or what's clear from what we see from our existing industry cohort is that the 
the industry that are there now, those large industries, semiconductor industries, they're investing in these technologies to allow scale up of photonics uh, integrated photonics into their system. That's clear it's happening. They see there's a demand coming. And on the other side, when we're dealing with industry partners and potential uh, collaborations, there's a whole raft of new and developing companies from Europe and from the US stepping into the breach here now to help the scale up in, in packaging or in other areas where it's typically been a, a slower or more costly process uh, to try and get from an, a large integrated or in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a relative sense, a large integrated area of photonics into the smaller and smaller towards the chip. I think what you see most of all from, from us is that not only is it that centers like ourselves, uh, IPIC and, and SFI are funding that, uh, and, other, and other funding agencies that are driving towards getting both the existing infrastructure to, to keep investing in this area because they, they see it, and to allow companies to step into the breach. And that's what we we're, we seem to be crossing over with a lot of the organizations now. Hey, David, your your photonics journey uh, in many ways started in research, uh, R&D, and, yes. and then it went to industry, and you've pivoted even within IPEC um, to the program management, business development side. Uh, I want to ask about the changes that you've observed or, or even maybe perceived. Um, what changes yeah, it's, um, are it's, prevalent? It's very interesting. I started off as a spectroscopist, and, and for anybody who's, who's not familiar with that, spectroscopy essentially is, is using, in a very simple sense, using measurements, uh, using light to measure uh, photonic activity. In, in our case, it was in DNA and, and it was samples. And um, what we worked in our group was really big, big pieces of equipment, you know, large optical benches. Uh, a, a lot of equipment essentially was, I would say, on a macro scale. And what I've seen as I progressed from I used to work in there and I moved to I worked in, in, in industry in the semiconductor industry and I moved across now into, into IPIC and, and UCC and Tyndall, you see that the 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 thing that has been discussed since the 80s when PICs first were were developed, you see it really come to fruition now. And integrated photonics and photonic integrated circuits is having its moment, it's having its it's really happening now, underpinned by the CHIPS Act. And you can see now from just from only those 20 years, it's gone from being an industry that's coming to an industry that's core to the success of the CHIPS Act and to uh, semiconductors and, and photonics in Europe. Uh, and, and Peter, I, I suppose we'll build on David's answer for you. You've had a long career. You've been in NASA, uh, startup experience through an integrated photonics lens uh, still. What changes have you perceived over that time? Well, really around manufacturing. So as David said, you know, it's been maybe two decades since this type of technology was first developed, uh, very much in a laboratory scale. Um, and it's only over the last, say, five years or so where we're starting to see talk about manufacturing. We're starting to see some serious companies. You know, when you start to see some big companies um, investing in large scale manufacturing. Like I think a very nice example is Ficom Tech who build packaging machines. If you look at their sales of packaging machines, you do see a very large ramp up over the last few years. So like they're, they're the guys who make the picks and shovels who kind of produce these components. So that's a really nice indicator um, to see. And, and, and you know, when you look at what they're doing, they're talking now about production lines where they can kind of marry uh, different assembly and packaging systems, for example, um, to, together to produce fully integrated production lines. Those kind of things have happened in the last five years. So you you now start to see the scale up, um, and that's a real challenge. And that's where, I'll go back to my original point, microelectronics has all that expertise, the understanding of how you scale um, in terms of the actual wafer manufacturing. I think the big challenge now is packaging because that's the area obviously I work in, and of course I'd say that, but you know, packaging does um, consume the majority of cost, um, and that's always been an issue. So historically, you're over half the price of, of, a, of a production or half the cost would be around packaging. The drive is to try and bring that down. Um, microelectronics generally is in the order of, say, 10 20% packaging cost. And as I said, photonics has always been over the uh, integrated photonics, always over the half halfway point, 50% plus. So we're driving towards bringing that down. And unless we can do that, um, that's gonna be a real challenge to kind of large scale uptake. And I do believe we have programs where we're working on things like um, ball grid array, wafer level, surface mount packaging, and they're, they're microelectronic approaches. 
So using the kind of expertise and understanding that has been already developed in microelectronics will help address some of those challenges. And again, they've only really started to kick in in the last five years. So wafer level um, packaging, um, using um, surface mount type of packaging approaches, because historically photonics has been driven by very expensive solutions like literally gold, gold boxes, we call them gold boxes, um, butterfly style packages, really, really expensive, impossible to scale to very large volumes. So again, this kind of drive and merge merger with the microelectronics world, we're starting to see that the last few years, it's hopefully been accelerated now by initials like the CHIPS Act, but that's what I've seen. So moving from a research to more scalable um, type solutions and that, that use and synergy with the microelectronics world is really accelerating that development. So, so certainly there are a few things going on in, in the PIC scape, uh, so to speak. You have uh, not just scaling and packaging, you have standardization, a lot of uh, drivers, I guess, a lot of undertakings. Yeah. Uh, and Peter, you've you've been in this space now for, well, I yeah. dare I say, as long as it's been a space in many ways. Um, and as this technology continues to ascend um, in terms of scaling and, and really just moving towards commercialization, um, there needs to be some sort of guidance for for businesses in the space. So I'm curious, what um, insight, what guidance you might have for those in the um, companies, the individuals who are driving this technology forward at this point? Well, the discipline is very important because generally photonics can be a little bit custom, well, a big, big custom, um, and in some sense a little bit disorganized, and that's a real challenge for people coming into this integrated photonics kind of world because. If you look at the microelectronics world, it's extremely organized, it's standardized, it's very difficult to customize anything. So really we have to get people to be more aware of these standardized approaches. I'm not saying formal standards, but things like PDKs, process design kits in founders, um, they're, they're critical to making things cost effective and scalable. Similarly in packaging, we're developing what we call ADKs, assembly design kits. And these are essentially software platforms, which are, you know, in uh, code like uh, Synopsys, for example, we're very close to Synopsys in our European pilot line picks up. And that really aids people to kind of follow design rules. Um, so following the disciplines that are already established or have been well established in the microelectronics world, we're doing, we want to do more and more of that. So engineers um, coming into this new domain, because you know, we're going to start to see people who are not familiar with photonics, but are really interested in the application of that technology to make their products. We have to make lower the barrier for those people. And the only way we can do, do that is by developing these types of tools and um, EDA tools, so electronic design tools, um, to make them more accessible and easier to use and much more menu driven type platforms. And there, that's one of the big things we're starting to do. We've been doing it for a number of years in our pilot line. And I think you'll start to see more and more of that, and it's really lowering the barrier for especially new entrants into this area. Uh, I'll also ask you, Peter, we've had a couple opportunities to, to introduce quantum to the conversation, mm. um, and increasingly yeah. quantum integration is becoming really fundamental to this um, you know, thousand foot dialogue we're having here. Yeah. Uh, just curious to get your thoughts on what's happening on quantum integration right now. Yeah, well, I suppose the one thing that stands out like a sore thumb in quantum from the terms of a lot of the uh, packaging in particular is the cryogenic requirements. So as I understand it, um, there are very demanding requirements for quantum, uh, very low, very high coupling efficiencies, very low loss. Um, but that needs to be done in, a, in an environment that's extremely challenging. So um, some of the numbers that are being quoted, like, you know, 0.1 dB loss, um, for example, for fiber attached, that's, that's really, really challenging number. Like to, to achieve that repeatedly is something exceptional. Like that's not even achievable today at room temperature, um, especially for, you know, silicon photonics, for example. So the challenges associated with the developing these types of future quantum products, especially in these very demanding environments, cryogenic, is something that we need to look at. And now the great thing is that it presents really interesting research opportunities. So in a sense, we've developed these kind of platforms for room temperature, for communications and so forth, but we need to now go back and utilize 
some of the new materials that are coming out. For example, epoxies are really not ideal at cryogenic temperatures because their their expansion coefficients are you know an order of magnitude higher and if not more than some of the conventional approaches. So looking at alternative materials to epoxies for attaching optical components. So there's a lot of research and development that needs to be done. So that's great for us. Um, it gives us new areas to investigate, but it is a challenge. And it seems like there's a demand for some of these quantum products, but uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to develop those. So let's take the, the this notion of high volume and high diversity in R&D pursuits into account. Um, not even to mention the different technologies that PICs are enabling, uh, much less mm. necessitating. Uh, that mm. necessitates, that commands different types of partnerships and collaborations. Uh, mm. So I'm curious to get your thoughts, David, on the types of those collaborations and partnerships that we're beginning to see in the uh, field. What you see what Peter is saying there, I think, really identifies the, the collaborative nature in this, in this area that's different than, than let's say, a straightforward um, approaching university or approaching a partner uh, and asking for work to be done. Things like ADKs and PDKs, what Peter has outlined, are fundamental to enabling everyone to work together. And that's the sort of work you see is happening here. And we've formed part of European projects or, or larger things like the PICSAP pilot line. What you're seeing, especially in Europe, is a real exchange of ideas and not a piecemeal attempt to solve this. And it, what's really interesting to watch is that there are competitors and people in the industry who will compete with each other commercially we're working really well together with institutes like Tyndall, but also other institutes across the Europe and the world. And AIM Photonics, for example, in America, that works with us as well to help lower those barriers. And I think for terms of collaborative elements, there's still going to be one-to-one -one interactions and, and, and driving individual solutions uh, forward. And what I think has been fantastic about this industry, seeing the challenges that it has, is that leaders like Peter in, in, in the academic and the research space are, are working directly with the foundation of this industry to try and step ahead of all these barriers that are coming. And uh, well, they have a great uh, uh, template to look at when you look at the electronics industry, the microelectronics industry, they're seeing that as the platform, although the solutions are almost always totally different, but the solution map roadmap is there. And that's what people like Peter and, and the co uh, companies that we're working with have identified and are working towards. Uh, building on that, yeah, certainly from IPIC itself, but, but you have PICSAP and you have MedFab, uh, a lot of support there. And, and you, you, now with MedFab, especially, you're bringing in a, a customer centric approach. What's the value to, to that dynamic in this space, David? So in, in, I'm part of MedFab and for, um, uh, for those unfamiliar with it, is a, is a European pilot line for medical devices and photonics. And we started out as, a, as an 18 uh, group uh, collaboration of, uh, of industry partners, leading research centers and small uh, companies as well across Europe. And what the big problem with a lot of that these pilot lines are being targeted at is the barrier to entry to get a demo or to low volume manufacturing or R&D in, in the medical device space is really, really high. So if you're a small uh, emerging company, you need a large uh, volume of, of investment in order to make regulated or, or ISO 13485 uh, regulated devices, which is medical device level. And the, this organization was set up to bring in some of the leading members in, 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 in the industry together with researchers to try and create a, a collaborative environment amongst all these partners to allow companies to approach us and at a, at a much more effective cost to be able to make a uh, low run or, or even just demo uh, demonstration level around devices. And what that's to allow them to do is that these small emerging version companies can then bring that either to get further investment or to then even go to the market with it. And at this level, if you see the individuals involved like Philips and Stryker, uh, Fraunhofer's in their CSEM, these organizations are very rarely put together in, in a single point of contact. And that's what's been developed in MedFab. So it's a single point of contact. You come in to us and we help you as a small or, or any size organization really, but typically it's small. We help connect you to the people who can help you. And I think it's that ease of allowing the business to happen by itself whilst offering the European Union backed uh, uh, support to help those organizations get there. So I think for any small, uh, small or medium enterprise in particular out there, but anybody who wants to get demos made in this space, Please just approach uh, MedFab. We'll help connect you to who could be helping in this space. I, I want to bring. Oh, sorry, Peter. 
Yeah, I was just sorry. I was just going to add to that because I think a very this collaboration uh, type model is is really important here because. Um, the, you know, use this term, the ecosystem. It's 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 very complex and it's very broad. So, you know, designers, um, the EDA software companies, the equipment yeah. manufacturers, wafer, the providers, and all that. I think a really nice example that has an enormous impact from a European kind of perspective is IMEC. IMEC have this affiliation kind of program where companies, all those different parts of the ecosystem, work together. For example, in IMEC in 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 in, uh, in Belgium. And that's proved extremely successful model. And we've been trying to mimic that somewhat um, in terms of integrated photonics, for example, with our pilot liner picks up where we bring people on site. So we have um, at Tyndall, we have Ficom Tech, that German uh, equipment provider I mentioned. We also have Celeprint. We also have some end users and um, they come and go. Um, but we have foundational partners and um, as I mentioned, the equipment companies. So having kind of more of those, I think, is essential. Rather than people working kind of independently, as David called a piecemeal, and um, doing different things um, and uh, reinventing the wheel, if you will. So more of these affiliation models are needed. So I think the CHIPS Act in Europe and the US are addressing that, maybe not specifically, but I think that's one of the motivations here. So that IMEC type model has proven itself to be extremely successful. We're kind of, in a sense, following that concept, and hopefully there will be more of that, you know, into the future. And, and I would welcome I, anyone I, to look at Pixap. Sorry, Jacob. I would welcome anyone to look at Pixap's model as well. So Pixap is another pilot line, as Peter is talking about, and, and MedPap is mim mimicking a lot of that sustainability approach. And what these are trying to do, these pilot lines, uh, in reality, if you, if you wanted to break it down, it's trying to break the barriers between the individuals who are there and, and actors in, in, in the market, and also then to bring future uh, collaborations together through a single point of contact and, and someone who can lead these activities and uh, help make it easier for everybody. And I can see that we saw that with PICSAP success and, and MedClub is, is following in its wake. And they don't have to be geographically in one, you know, in one geographic location. Like ideally, yes. So everybody's together, working together on site. But you can, like originally when I set up PICSAP um, a number of years ago as the, as the coordinator of that program, um, Obviously, it's impossible to get everybody together, especially in a short period of time. But one of the things we did is we we worked towards kind of these ADK design standards. So we had kind of this kind of standardized approach, and that was the glue that fixed everybody together. Everybody worked towards a common design standard. But ideally, as I say, it's good to have everybody in one location. I think we need more of those. I you know I, I have here a question on my, my cheat sheet about the Dutch model and in many ways and in many circles that is viewed as the gold standard and that obviously envelops IMEC. Um and, and we've mentioned the, the EU Chips Act and the US Chips Act. We've sort of grouped them together and I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but there, there is a bit of nuance here, and one of the things that's happening in the U.S., for example, is this development of eight microelectronics commons hubs. So that's eight innovation hubs, and, and one of the, the dangers, I guess, is that um, if you have eight hubs, you risk eight different models, and for the companies and the innovators that are required to, to leverage these hubs, uh, that, that really places a burden on them. Um, is there more value in mimicking the IMEC model, say, or is there value for different types, different models um, in this ecosystem? Well, I think there is value to have, you know, some level of differentiation, but I think that we'll always work towards some common objective, like the principle of um, standardization, PDKs, ADKs, all of those things will should be employed by them all. And they might have different flavors, they might be addressing, because this is a very wide domain, so they might be addressing different technological aspects or different parts of the supply chain or a part of the ecosystem. So I can understand that there, you will have variations and, and, and there's probably a need for that and a value for that. Um, but I do think they should follow certain common themes, you know, as I mentioned, standardization and so forth. But um, you know, this, this is such a large and growing market. I think to kind of focus down and hunker down in one area could be very risky. So I can see the benefits to um, you know having diversity across different um, you know different hubs or whatever whatever the term is used. I, I suppose the elephant. Um in the virtual room here is that there isn't an IMEC in the US. There's not the, a Fraunhofer network. There, there's no Letty. Um, 
you know, the well, R&D dynamic is, is slightly different. That, that's well, worth pointing I, I, out. Would, I would shout out for AIM Photonics. I think they've done great work. Like AIM, AIM are not around that long, really, in the grand scheme of things. And I think they've really come up to speed. We work with them. Um, so there's a number of people there, David Harme, and there's uh, others. But they have done fantastic work. The, the investment has been well used. They are really developing some really fantastic technology. So, you know, I think there's a lot of good happening there. And they're also, you know, investing in packaging and so forth. And they have a very comprehensive PDK. And I think a lot of people are extracting quite a bit of benefit out of that. So I think that's been money well spent there. And, you know, as I, it's nice to see Europe and the U.S. collaborating. We have a workshop later this week at ECOC in, in, in Glasgow. And uh, AIM and ourselves are working together in, in sharing that. So, you know... As I say, we do find a lot of common ground um, and there's benefits to working together, but they've done a lot of good work over the last decade, I would say. It is it is worth uh, shouting out, AIM, I think, especially yeah. in this context. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that, Peter. And, and I think that one of the things that the uh, CHIPS Act in the U.S. has done is put AIM increasingly on the map, not put it mm -hmm. on the map, but increase its visibility. Um, and I think for the, the entire ecosystem, that's one of the uh, main benefits or outcomes from, from the CHIPS Act. Um, but there are some nuances here between the EU CHIPS Act and the US CHIPS Act. So I'll ask you about the EU CHIPS Act. Um, most tangible outcomes that you've perceived? Well, yeah, I, maybe there are some differences. I, I haven't seen too many. I, like I have, there's people from the US have visited here. And, you know, I, I've been in the US seeing what the objectives there. I think, you know, for example, just from a European perspective, there's a very strong focus in Europe on SMEs, so small to medium enterprises, because, you know, that's that's the lifeblood of a lot of industry here. And to foster um, new new areas, like especially in medical devices, um, it's been difficult for me to speak in detail about what's happening in the US, but just from a European perspective, I mentioned is lowering the barrier. So, you know, not, not just photonics experts or microelectronic experts. We're trying to bring in people who are new to this area, maybe with some really good ideas. Like a lot of, I'm pretty sure in the next five or 10 years, there'll be products developed which we never even considered at this point in time. So things will evolve rapidly. But from a European perspective, there's a really strong focus on small to medium enterprises and helping them grow. And obviously to have some linkage, especially with, you know, the U.S., there's a lot of common ground there. I just mentioned our work with AIM. But, um, you know, so that, that's an important driver. We have a, a major program called Photon Hub Europe. Um, and Photon Hub Europe, its, its objective there is to support especially small to medium enterprises and also training. So training the future workforce, because that's obviously, you speak to any company nowadays, getting people with experience or just getting people, getting good engineers and training them internally, that's a real challenge. So that's something that we really have to focus on. And actually, I think that is a common ground between here and the US Chips Act. Training is something we both recognize as a big challenge and something we need to work on a lot more. David, thoughts on training? Because certainly that does uh, factor in prominently uh, to your pursuits as well. Yeah, uh, training is one of these, uh, what's amazing about an institute like Tyndall and working with people like Peter's team and, and PixApp and, and, and other organizations within here is that we are, we are really unique, uh, Tyndall in, in Ireland in particular. We have amazing infrastructure, fabrication facilities, we have a training fab, we have things like PixApp's uh, packaging training courses um, and multiple other ones to do with photonics. And what, what you see from individuals here, uh, when I did my PhD, you know, we, we had a very, uh, it was more for open system, it's quite a long time ago, but now it's really, really well structured. And I, I think one of the one of the best things about coming to, to train a university, uh, sorry, an institute like Tyndall, is the ability to get not only your research experience, and it's very, very key to your next development stage, but also there's real practical leading edge technology experience here in, in terms of packaging and fabrication. So what we see on our people leave here, they're, they're, they're taken directly into industry. So 70% of our graduates who leave uh, IP, Go to industry, and the vast majority of them go straight into the photonics or semiconductor industry um, directly. So, we're, the skills that are built here are in real key demand, and uh, I think it's a fantastic thing to be able to to come here. And we and and we also welcome people from the outside who are training elsewhere, who are postdocs or who are in industry. So, if you're interested in the areas that we work in, and um, we're really really welcome to to train people in the industry and elsewhere uh, in the areas we're working. 
So we've talked now about um, on the technology side integration. We've talked about standardization, um, metrology. We've talked about packaging um, and sort of off technology. We've talked about partnerships and, and the supply chain a little bit as well. Um, there are many, many more areas where we could see breakthrough progress. Um, you talk about lasers, pixels, uh, certainly a candidate. Material science, gallium nitride technology or progress in that technology area has been immense. So I'm curious to get both of your thoughts on where you see the next major breakthrough taking place, given that there are so many areas, candidates for that to happen. Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's there's fundamental breakthroughs in, in material science that are needed. Um, but I think in for me, what's most interesting is the manufacturing breakthroughs. So the ability to scale, because the challenge is we, we can come up with all these great ideas and um, exciting materials and, um, you know, uh, all, all, all this basic research or fundamental research, but we have to be able to drive it through and bring it to, you know, manufacturing or bring it to production and develop new and exciting products. And I, I mean, I'm beginning to see that happening, as I mentioned at the start, the kickoff of this discussion. And for me, that's really where you know, some of the exciting developments are, are going to happen. And as a result, that will have positive feedback into, you know, uh, this, this more fundamental research. So we have to see progress. So like we, we mentioned quantum. We now want to start to see quantum deliver, um, especially around integrated photonics, deliver products and um, get out to the market. We need to support people and um, scale up manufacturing. Once that's a success, you know, you build up a certain level of momentum and that will um, excite more fundamental developments in quantum. And I think one of the big challenges I see is in quantum, why I describe it is you've got the physics domain of quantum where people are coming up with new and interesting approaches for quantum based technologies. And then you have the engineering discipline, engineering domain where we start to take those and produce products. You look at manufacturing. And I think that kind of boundary is where the challenge is at right now. It's to kind of pull things out of the physics domain, move it into the engineering domain. I mentioned cryogenic, for example. And once we start to see that kind of development, that will gain a certain amount of momentum, positive feedback into the more fundamental approaches and, 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 and look at new materials and so forth. So my, my area of real interest is that manufacturing, that higher TRL, and hopefully that will then you know, accelerate more fundamental developments. I think one area that's of interest for myself is uh, heterogeneous integration in itself. All, all, all the activities, all the equipment, all the approaches surrounding that, that allows integration of different manufacturing components into higher level assemblies. That that idea, the, the try and scale that it was Peter was saying, the, to bring that true manufacturing, all of the challenges that are really in there, which involve equipment challenges, Material challenges, uh, test repeating, having having a really really high throughput, whilst also maintaining uh, really high uh, success rates. That to me is one of the areas that I think we're going to have uh, a big uh, play in in, in in Ireland in the future and in, in Europe. Peter, you alluded to this this earlier, and as this this technology and this ecosystem as a whole are advancing, there are barriers to overcome now, but there are bound to be new barriers, new bottlenecks that emerge. Um, you know, as the good continues to grow, the the not so good will also continue right alongside it. Um, curious if you have any barriers that you are forecasting, any bottlenecks that you anticipate as being the next big one to overcome that may not be at the fore of things just yet. Well, it's always been a barrier. Optical packaging has definitely been a, a challenge, and I think that's something that we do need to address. Like typically, um, we're packaging devices. I've, I've mentioned this in a number of my talks. We're packaging devices at the edge of the chip, the facet, typically, and there's a lot of problems with that. You know, in terms of equipment, we, you know, the electronics world, we're packaging on the surface, and that enables us to work at the wafer level. Whereas in the photonics domain, we're packaging at the edge of the chip. That means we have to work at the device level. So in a sense, this optical packaging approach is very much package by package. It has throughput limits because we have to work with individual packages rather than at wafer level. So moving the optical interface onto the surface of the, the wafer of the chip really will alleviate that problem. And I think that's the big challenge. And that's something we are now starting to work on. Because if you move it to the surface of the wafer, it enables more easier, it may, enables easier approaches like machine vision automation. You can see the top of the wafer. You don't need to treat the facet anymore in any particular way. 
you can increase, go from uh, you know a, a one-dimensional uh, set of waveguides to a two-dimensional on the surface. So you can increase the bandwidth, the optical bandwidth. Uh, you've got a higher density of optical ports. That's definitely um, a big challenge, and I think it's a huge opportunity. I believe that'll be solved in the next, say, five years or so with a number of approaches like Evanes and coupling, um, and there's other approaches using micro, micro optics. What we really need is to work more closely with the foundries because historically, you know, the optical integration with, with silicon has been a challenge for foundries. So they just want to, you know, just hand over the, the, the wafers, you dice them up or, um, and, and package them. We need those foundries to work closer with us to enable that surface level optical packaging. And I think that's going to be a major breakthrough. It'll enable us to move to wafer level and, and, and really start to work with the same type of topology as electrical packaging. You know, so it's on the surface. We use similar materials. We can eliminate epoxies. Um, machine automation will be much easier. So that's really an important challenge in the next couple of years. And I'll, I'll end with this. There are there are good places to exchange ideas. There are great places to exchange ideas. And you have a particularly nice platform um, at Tyndall. I pick within it. Uh, just thoughts on that. And, um, you know, if I, I suppose a, uh, a look ahead um, on that front. Yeah, I think I think uh, the essence, the, 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 you know, a key for me is collaboration. So, um, you know, our best work is done in some cases outside our lab. We collaborate with others. Um, now, obviously, there are issues of confidentiality and so forth. They, David mentioned companies can work independently, but they can collaborate in areas of common challenge. You know, I mentioned about uh, wafer level packaging, but also things like standardization and PDKs, ADKs, um, and this type of affiliation kind of model on site working together. For me, that's the main takeaway message of this discussion today. We need more of that. Um, and I think we've successfully shown. How, for example, we work with our collaborators in the US, they're very important to us um, because there's a huge critical mass there. So, um, you know, closer collaboration between Europe um, and the US is really kind of something that really excites me. And I want to do more and more of that. Um, you know, obviously there's there's limits to that. Uh, we have to respect certain confidentiality issues and so forth. But I think that's really, really an important thing to do. That concludes this week's episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to our news editor, Jake Saltzman, as well as to this week's sponsors. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pitch us ideas, and let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at allthingsphotonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as on our website, photonics.com.